it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome the participants and guests of our fourth Central European Symposium, uh, whose theme this year is 1989 and beyond, uh, the new shape of Europe. I'm Diane Conker, and I'm the director of CIS, and it's, it gives me great personal pleasure uh, to host this symposium this year. Uh, first, uh, some essential health and safety announcements. The toilets are upstairs. If you can find your way back the way you came, or you can follow the breadcrumbs uh, to get out. Uh, there is no fire alarm planned, so if you hear a fire alarm, it's real. Uh, and there's an emergency exit there, uh, and also the way you came in. Uh, and finally, this is not either health nor safety, but don't forget to tweet uh, your reactions uh, as the symposium proceeds. So I've been on this job a little more than one year, uh, and one of my pleasant tasks has been to participate in the planning of this symposium, along with representatives of the Austrian Cultural Forum London and the embassies of the Czech Republic, uh, of Poland and Slovakia, and our own UCL staff. And I want to give them all a great thank you for all the help uh, and support and, and ideas uh, that they've contributed. Uh, this is the fourth symposium that we've uh, hosted here at CIS. Uh, and while change has been a constant factor in the Central European region since over, for over 30 years, I'm sure that you'll agree that the, the consideration of the shape of Europe in 2019 has never been so timely. Uh, when we planned the date for the symposium, we had no idea it might take place on the eve of such an extraordinary catastrophe uh, in British and European political life. Uh, and I'm grateful to the European leaders for postponing that catastrophe until Halloween so that we can have maybe a few more symposia to consider <coughs> what is going on. Um, anyway, I'm looking forward to what each of the distinguished panelists uh, has to tell us about conditions and challenges and opportunities the region faces today. As the new champion of Slavonic and East European studies, uh, I want to say a few more words about the School of Slavonic and East European Studies because I'd like you to know what a remarkably unique institution is hosting this invaluable symposium today. UCL CIS is one of the world's leading specialist institutions and the largest national center in the UK for the multidisciplinary study of Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe and Russia. Uh, CIS was founded in 1915 by Thomas Garik Masaryk, uh, who was later elected first president of Czechoslovakia. It was then part of King's College, but subsequently functioned as an independent entity within the federal structure of the University of London. And in 1999, CIS became part of UCL. And in 2004, it, merged, it moved into our present purpose-built and prize-winning building, uh, which you will be invited to visit uh, for the reception after the symposium. Uh, the CIS library in the center of this building with over uh, 400,000 items is one of the largest in the world devoted to East European studies. CIS is currently educating about 1,000 students. About 700 of these are undergraduates, pursuing degrees in a number of different program areas, including history, economics and business, politics and sociology, and language and culture. <coughs> At the postgraduate level, we offer both teaching and research uh, MA degrees, including the International Masters in Economy, State, and Society, which is a double degree program with a consortium of European universities, including UCL, University of Belgrade, Charles University, Corvinus University, Helsinki University, the Higher School of Economics in Moscow and St. Petersburg, Jagiellonian University, and the University of Tartu. And currently we have about 60 PhD students uh, who are pursuing their studies here. CIS is home to perhaps the largest concentration of academic staff to the study of the region, uh, with about 60 academics whose fields include history, business and economics, politics, sociology, literature and culture, and the teaching of foreign languages. Uh, we have the capacity to teach 18 languages of the region, and we employ 27 part-time or full-time language teachers on our staff. Uh, in addition to research and teaching, the third crucial mission of CIS has been to collaborate with the public, providing and mobilizing <coughs> expertise for government, the public sphere, and the general public. Uh, we take great satisfaction in working with the governments of the region we study in order to provide information and to support our learning environments. So this symposium is an outstanding example of the kind of collaboration that is so fundamental to what we do at CIS. I arrived in London uh, a little over 12 months ago at a moment of great uncertainty about future relations between the United Kingdom and the rest of the world. Uh, EU membership has played an inestimable role for the UK in fostering academic interchange and collaboration. 
Europe is indeed changing, uh, but whatever the outcome of Brexit, uh, we all have our hopes, uh, the work of communication and collaboration represented by this symposium will, must guarantee uh, that open intellectual borders will remain uh, the hallmark of our roles in the academy, uh, in the world of scholarly inquiry and in the realm of public affairs. Now let me explain the format for today's symposium, which is also outlined in your programs. We'll have three panels of experts, uh, chaired by a moderator. Each of the panelists will speak for a maximum of 10 minutes on the theme of the panel, and then we'll open up the floor for discussion and questions. We'll start the symposium this morning with an historical look at 1989, uh, in which the role of Central European states and societies played the catalytic role. Uh, it marked the onset of the triple transition uh, in the region, uh, transition to capitalist economies, to participatory democracy, and to independent statehood, which has provided scholars with, with a, a social laboratory uh, and opportunities to understand the world and to help change it. I expect the panelists will comment on the transformation of the European economic and political order and also how this triple transition changed memories, mentalities, and expectations. Our second panel will look at Europe today. On one hand, a remarkably united community of 27 plus one uh, who have proved to be resilient defenders of the idea of Europe. Uh, but this contemporary Europe is also faced with real challenges, managing the Eurozone, uh, the stresses of migration, uh, the rise of populism, and the question of how the Union can and should police standards of justice among its members, uh, and increasingly how to relate to the maverick member of the EU, the United Kingdom. Our final panel will polish up its crystal ball and discuss prospects for change and continued stability across the European Union at a moment when one of its founding members intends to leave uh, and when new members seek to hitch their fate to the idea of United Europe. As the shape of Europe changes, what role will Central Europeans play in responding to the challenges of populism, immigration, and fragmentation? In all three of these realms, it is obvious that the perspective from Central Europe is fundamental. So I want to extend a particular welcome to our panelists and chairs uh, who came, come to us in the worlds of <coughs> diplomacy, academia, culture, uh, business, and government, often combining more than one of these portfolios. I also look forward to seeing you at the end of the day uh, at the symposium reception in the Masaryk common room on the fourth floor of the CIS building. Uh, so as I rush off to another meeting, which is part of my <coughs> responsibility, I wish you a very pleasant, uh, stimulating, and productive symposium. I'll turn it over to our panel. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here this morning um, to discuss 1989, which for some of us, uh, may seem very remote, but indeed, um, for those of us who were in the prime of our careers, it seems like only yesterday. Um, we have three very interesting and very different perspectives today on 1989 in this first panel. Um, first of all, uh, Bell Schreilau, a uh, well-known producer, filmmaker, and author in Vienna, is going to show us a short clip of one of her films, um, part of a trilogy to do with 1989, exploring how 1989 influenced the future, uh, and in particular, um, subsequent events, both at an economic, cultural, and political level. Uh, and then Professor Shimizwar Suroshki is going to talk to us um, about the Polish contribution. Um, I lived in Poland in 1989, and uh, I was constantly reminded by my friends in the Polish opposition that this wasn't just any old country. This was a country that had brought down a government in the early 1980s and was going to finish the job off by bringing down the entire system, which, of course, the Poles did. And then finally, Professor Mary Heinemann from the University of Cardiff is going to talk to us a bit about how the mentalities and uh, memories of uh, 1989 have impacted subsequent events. Um, Professor Hyman is writing, or has written, I should say, a book which eagerly awaited on communist uh, Catholic relations, uh, an absolutely fascinating topic um, for Central European scholars, and we're looking forward to perhaps having some of that perspective. Um, I will only just say a few words about um, my own sort of evaluation of 1989, 
Um, I think it's very important to always bear in mind it wasn't a rivalry between two superpowers in a classical conventional way. It was a rivalry between two systems, between two ways of looking at the world, between two ways of organizing um, commercial, political, and intellectual activity. And there were curious corollaries of this. One at a cultural level was that we had, perhaps in contrast to later periods, um, a race to the top. So the Eastern Europeans were always very keen to make sure that their orchestras were at least as good as our orchestras. Uh, and so you had these trophy figures like Kurt Mazur produced in East Germany, uh, the Dresden Schatzkapelle, um, which was supposed to rival the Vienna Philharmonic or the London Symphony Orchestra. Um, and then at a the commercial level, of course, um, for those of us of my generation brought up in England, we were um, always encouraged to regard capitalism as something that should have a human face. In fact, political careers could be broken if they were perceived to be pursuing a version of capitalism that didn't have a political, um, a, a, a human face. So um, the, the removal of communism gave globalization and what I think is called in many parts of Central Europe still turbo capitalism tremendous momentum and impetus. Uh, and then, of course, finally, politically, uh, we moved from what Robert Cooper, <coughs> in that wonderful book of his, The Breaking of Nations, which I certainly, none of you have read it, or if some of you have not read it recently, um, it's absolutely a seminal text on, on the organization, political organization of Europe after, after the end of the Cold War. Um, he describes the movement from pre-modern to modern to postmodern, the European Union being the classic example of a postmodern arrangement uh, of sovereignty on the political level, which actually not only allows, but encourages interstate interference at a certain level. Uh, and that how that is actually welcomed by the participant states and indeed seen as a positive aspect. Um, but anyway, before further ado, I'll hand over to Bell, who will perhaps um, manage to get the technology to produce in 10 minutes of that film. Thank you. Um, hello. Yes, um, this is a big challenge for me to speak in English here, but uh, I will do it and I will try my best. Um, before, I have a little surprise for you. Um, a fellow from the past. I brought. I have brought my friend um, Thomas, or at least parts of him. Hello. Okay, um, yes, it is 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. I was uh, 20, border crossings were opened and uh, nothing was the same as before. And what did it leave behind? A deep rift between East and West. The rift is an open wound for many people, including myself. Since then, I have been uh, dancing and writing and directing plays which look at this wound from different angles. One such play is Goodbye Europe, uh, which has three parts. And now I want to show you a trailer of Goodbye Europe 1 called How I Slept Through the Fall of the Berlin Wall. <coughs> or in Berlin slang, um, wie ich die Mauerfall verpente. Ich war Hamlet. Ich stand an der Küste und redete mit der Brandung bla bla. Im Rücken die Ruinen von Europa. Man muss aus der Zeit raussteigen, um sie anzusehen. Das ist ein Traum. 
was der Mensch braucht, ist nicht käuflich. Das System ist menschenfeindlich. Revolutionen gehen von unten aus. Unten und oben wechseln ihre Plätze in dem Wertesystem. Und dieser Wechsel stellt die Gesellschaft vom Kopf auf die Füße. Auf einmal hat der Westen nur gute Absichten. Wir werden die Schluck mit Haut und Haar. Tatsächlich, ich habe den Mauerfall wirklich verpennt. Und das, obwohl Bärbel Strehlau vom Grenzübergang, der als erster geöffnet wurde, nur 500 Meter entfernt wohnte. Weil ich saß tatsächlich bei meinen Eltern auf dem Sofa und hatte mal wieder Liebeskummer und habe den DDR-Abendfilm geschaut und dann kam halt die Pressekonferenz und da wurde gesagt, ja, also ab jetzt ist die Reiseregelung, ab jetzt kann jeder DDR-Bürger... Reisen. Ihr persönliches Erleben und die politischen Entwicklungen, auch in Bezug auf die Europäische Union, hat die Regisseurin Bärbel Strelau in ein Stück verpackt. Goodbye Europe oder wie ich den Mauerfall verpennte. Yes, um, what can I say? This performance is from 2013. We are now in 2019 and I'm still waiting for the decision that will move Europe in a new direction. In ancient Greek, crisis means decision. There's a saying, those who decide not to live will die. This is the nature of crisis. The European Union is in crisis. It continues to be ruled by a business and fina finance lobby that is tearing Europe apart. This has to stop. We need a change of the economic and political order that is based on solidarity, not competition. Wouldn't you agree? Instead, human rights have been drowning in the Mediterranean for years. Governments of the extreme right in Austria and other European countries and neoliberal capitalism threaten our democracy. To me, it looks like we have lost the key to what it means to be human. Given the developments of the last 30 years, our European success stories should make us choke. Let's face the truth. The European crisis is self-made. Let's see it as a chance for structural change and innovation. We need a real alternative. Heiner Müller said in 90, 1990, I quote, the angel of history flies backwards. What I say today is that the angel is still flying in the same direction. It is no longer a question of time when it will fall from the sky. Now, let's look back to 89. Um, five words symbolize 89 for me. Chance, change, moral courage, democracy, and will. By 89, East Germany was ready for change. West Germany was not. We were ready to discard the old system and risk something completely new. The West was happy to hang on to the status quo uncritically. What it wanted was reunification and the opportunity to sell even more goods. However, 
there was plenty of room for fundamental social and political <coughs> change. But after the so-called glorified reunification, these opportunities were gone. This is what historically 1989 really means to me. In the words of Heiner Müller, a time wall has fallen and suddenly we find ourselves in the rooms with unknown dimensions. How right he was. After reunification, I found myself in a place where I never wanted to, do, uh, wanted to be. I felt like a foreigner in my own country. You can compare the experience um, to living in your own flat on a sublet. Suddenly, I was a citizen of the Federal Republic of Germany. I received an FAG passport, but I didn't want one. This was not, this was not the reason why I went out onto the streets with many others in 89. This was not the reason why I joined meetings of civil rights movements in private kitchens, pretending we were reading groups. Ours was a peaceful revolution, a protest of civilians who no longer wanted the same as the government. We put the government under so much pressure that it had to resign. We had a plan, but it did not include the capitalist system of the FRG. Alas, all our efforts failed when the negotiation for the reunification treaty started. Here I would like to quote Christa Wolf, within a few weeks, the chances for a new approach to an alternative society disappeared before our eyes. And this is a crack when it comes to understanding 89 and everything that happened in its wake. Although we had just started the process of controlling the destiny of society ourselves, the revolution was taken from us. What an awakening, what a chance, having to leave all this in the hands of a system that was not at all interested in changing itself. That was painful. That is a real tragedy. It is also the tragedy of my own story, which I have learned to use creatively as a human being and as an artist. By the way, did you know that the reunification treaty is regarded as the most peculiar in human history? Because one of the two signatories was completely eradicated, namely the GDR. Believe it or not, I'm an alien. And so my country disappeared from the map on October 3rd, 1991. It was a buyout. Officially, the West was now entitled to take everything at dumping prices. The gap left behind by the Iron Curtain was quickly filled with consumer goods, high bank buildings, shopping centers, and petrol stations. Neoliberalism established itself. That was the moment the EU began to fall apart. And 30 years later, we are looking on as society is pushed to the brink at full speed. Maybe it is time to look at the Eastern Bloc in a different light. Maybe the movement of 89 was only an impetus for change, waiting to be realized once again 30 years later. We need the same ideas. A community that stands together in solidarity, equality and democracy. We should stop looking at the capitalist system as a natural law, as something that cannot be overturned. <laughs> Let's finally develop awareness of a humane alternative. Let's make a decision. Let's risk taking 
the step in a new direction. If I have learned anything from 89, it is that change is possible. Think of uh, utopia as something that is missing. This is a sentence from Goodbye Europe Part 3 called Out of the Blue. I would like to end with a prologue of my three hundred nymphs from this play with regards from the future. Yes, uh, one more thing. Sometimes I think um, I went to bed in Berlin on November 989 that I'm still sleeping. And I hope that one day I will wake up and a utopian dream has become real. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, of course, it wasn't just um, people from the GDR who perhaps felt in a sense of dislocation. Um, most West Germans who had lived 
in Berlin, in West Berlin, also felt that they had lost the country, or at least the city, that they had chosen to live in. Um, many of them went to West Berlin precisely because it wasn't a West German city. Um, so the sense of loss uh, was, was very, very great, and I'm grateful for your reminding us of that. So, uh, Professor Zhirovsky, um, if you would like to now take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel to be honored and privileged to address uh, such an extraordinary audience after such an extraordinary artistic vision uh, of what happened in 1989 and around. Uh, that's a great challenge to come back to uh, tangible history and politics of the epoch. Uh, and I would like to divide my uh, remarks into three parts. Uh, the roots of what happened in 1989, especially from Polish perspective, then what really happened in 1989 and what are the consequences till today. Uh, I am aware of the time limits, uh, so please uh, forgive me some indispensable simplifications. I hope you will understand uh, the necessity of it. Uh, of them. So, uh, starting with the roots, especially from the Polish point of view, uh, first I would like to stress that uh, from the Polish point of view it was completely different than what we have just heard. Uh, Poland, uh, since, um, well, I will start like that. Since 1468, Poland was a country that was ruled by bicameral uh, uh, parliament uh, that dominated the system since 1505. Why it's important? It's important because there is a deep sense of being citizens and not subjects. Uh, and the second important uh, remark is that communism, since the very beginning, was perceived in Poland as a foreign system imposed on our country by uh, the military victory of the Soviet Union that was only one of the mutation of Russian Empire. And the uh, struggle against Russian Empire is a core stream of Polish history since uh, the uh, late uh, 15th century. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, unlikely in Eastern Germany, uh, the communist Poland called Polish People's Republic, uh, in a deep sense, was not our country that we lost. It was an artificial construction imposed on Poland by foreign empire that was commonly perceived as a barbarian one, uh, by traditional enemy, and in 1989, we regained our country. We became again citizens and not subjects. And having in mind that long tradition of the struggle, please remember that there were some common things with the other <coughs> Central European peoples or countries and some Polish specifics. What is common, with an exception of uh, Czechoslovakia due to the uh, Prague coup d'etat of 1949, uh, that was the, uh, the Prague genuine, uh, the Czech genuine movement without the presence of the Soviet troops on the soil. And, uh, while all the other countries uh, had the same uh, origins of uh, communist system, namely they were occupied by the Soviet troops and uh, the system was imposed on them. Uh, so uh, between 1985 and 1989, uh, well, and one uh, remark on the side, please remember that when we think or uh, consider history and politics, we should watch it in a way in which we watch a movie and not a photo. It's very dynamic. So it was not that clear in 1985 what was to some extent clear in the spring 1989 and completely clear in the autumn 1989. Namely, that all the governments in our part of Europe, the communist governments, are not able anymore to blackmail their peoples with Soviet military interference. And something that was the fundament of the communist rule in Central Europe was that uh, possibility to blackmail credibly, um, in a credible way, uh, the peoples with the Soviet military interference. Due to uh, Pierestroika, that uh, ceased to be political reality somewhere between uh, 85 and 89. Uh, that is something in common for the entire region. Uh, while what was Polish specific was the fact that uh, at least since uh, 1978, when John Paul II was elected as uh, a pope, 
mm, or Cardinal Votina Voiltiwa was elected as a Pope, John Paul II, mm, there was a practical ideological death of communism in Poland. I mean, uh, the people pretend to believe uh, for career reasons, but nobody believed in that, indeed, even the high uh, communist officials. Uh, then, uh, for the first time since 1939, uh, next year in 79, uh, the Poles could uh, count themselves uh, during the great uh, papal messes, uh, holy services that were served in Poland. When two million of people gathered uh, in Kraków uh, meadows uh, and looked around and said, well, we are here, we are the Poles, two million of people, who is a communist? Nobody. Uh, so that was uh, a mental change. Then uh, I uh, would like to stress the importance of Polish diaspora in the West, uh, especially in the United States, in Britain, in France, and in Germany, which was quite huge, both from the, the Second World War times and then the fact that uh, relatively, I would like to stress the word relatively, it was relatively easy for the Poles in comparison to Eastern Germans or Soviets or uh, other peoples uh, to travel to the West, to have that uh, personal experience of the West and to draw the conclusions. Uh, next very important factor was the decline of the um, imaginary German threat that was the uh, hereditary of the Second World War. Yeah, it was different in the 50s, different in the 60s, in the 80s it died. Uh, so that another tool in the Moscow hand that uh, they could blackmail mm, us with the German revenge, the same way was between Poles and Lithuanians, Poles and Ukrainians and Poles and Belarusians, but Poles played the role of Germans, yeah, those threat that is going to take the territories that were lost uh, by mm, Poland as a result of the Second World War. So that were the, uh, the beginnings. Then please remember that unlike in the other uh, countries, uh, there was no just dissident movement in Poland. That was um, a huge opposition that for the first time in the communist bloc was not broken as a result of the massive use of force, that means the martial law that was declared in 1981 and proved to be ineffective. Uh, the military intervention was effective in Berlin in 53, in Budapest in 56, in Prague in 68. In Poland it was not effective. Uh, even after that, thousands of thousands of people were involved in clandestine anti-communist activity, especially uh, distributing information. Please remember it was time before internet. And so it was extremely important to distribute uh, clandestine newspapers, clandestine books and so on. Uh, and uh, that mental changes that uh, resulted from that activity were completely irreversible. And that was thousands of thousands of people, unlikely in other countries. That brought both benefits and threats. Benefits because of the scale of the phenomenon. Threats because it was not the underground state like during the Second World War that uh, had its own army, its own uh, counterintelligence and so on. So the communists had eight years to penetrate the movement with their secret services. And of course, it would be naive to uh, expect that the e efficacy of that activity was zero per percent. Of course not. Yeah. So unlikely in other countries where that small um, dissident groups were to the large extent uh, homogenic and unpenetrated. Um, who was uh, bought? Yeah, that was known, but generally, uh, at least that great names like Havel, for example, were clear, completely clear. That was not the case in Poland. Uh, so then, uh, when 1989 started, when uh, the um, round table was gathered, uh, that was a mixture of real uh, opponents and uh, communist agents. And please remember that unlikely in Germany, we had no another state with its apparatus, with uh, officials, well-trained people that could take the administration and run the country. Uh, we inherited the state apparatus from the communist times and there was a problem of uh, decommunization and purification of the structure in order to build up the uh, genuine Polish state, democratic one. This is a problem till today. I mean, for example, uh, the famous and I guess well known to you uh, struggle over a juridical system in Poland had the roots in that epoch. I mean, 
uh, the last purification of judges took place in 1981 and was the result of the communist purification of judiciary when all non-hard communist uh, judges were expelled from the uh, system and then it was uh, recreated on the principle of cooptation till today. Yeah, so now uh, this closed group uh, that was then selected in around 1981 as a product of uh, martial law now is being reformed, which is the uh, area of the battlefield of the political struggle in Poland today. Then, uh, talking about political dynamics, uh, please remember that when Poland started the uh, process in the spring 1989, uh, Poland was the first. There was no experience how to transfer the country from communist system into the democratic one. There were no sentiments to uh, communists whatsoever, in that sense that uh, market economy called capitalism or liberal capitalism and democracy was the only desirable system and uh, there was no mental compromise about that in Poland. Uh, you would sound like a backward, ill-educated uh, man when you say that there is something good in communism. No, nothing is good. Uh, uh, that is the, the primitive Russian system that was imposed on us and we have to get rid of it as quick as, as possible. The only limits were geopolitics. Yeah? Whether, we, whether it's reasonable or not to confront the system immediately in the spring 1989. And the decision was not. And that uh, we need uh, much more sophisticated tactics to get rid of the system. But then when you combine it with this uh, mixed character of the elites, please remember that only prime minister was not communist, while the minister of uh, defense, the minister of home affairs, that means the head of police, and the president of the country, uh, that were all hard communists, Jaruzelski, Kiszczak, and uh, Siewicki, the generals of the communist system. Uh, so uh, we cannot say that there was the first non-communist government, that was the first non-communist prime minister, but the government was not full uh, democratic. Uh, then, please remember uh, that there was a very uh, hard and poisoning fact at the very beginning, namely, uh, there was a contract that was uh, agreed upon during the uh, round table negotiations about the result of the elections. So there were no free elections. 35% of the members of parliament uh, mm -hmm. were elected as a result of free elections, while 65% were just nominated among the communist uh, party and the so-called allied communist parties, like peasants uh, party and uh, uh, artisans party that were puppet parties that pre that was a part that were a part of the political theater uh, that pretend that there is multi-party system in Poland during communist times so uh, that was reality and that contract was rejected by the Poles during the first stage of elections on June the 4th 1989 when all the communist uh, candidates were uh, rejected by the electorate. And what happened? Something unheard of. The electoral law was changed between the first and the second stage of elections in order to keep the uh, contract and not in order to respect the will of the people. Uh, that was the first lesson of ill democracy. I mean, the people realized that uh, they vote in one way, while what really matters is the uh, agreement of the elites. That uh, was repeated uh, in the next years to come. Um, not in that brutal way, yeah, but generally um, the result of the elections uh, were in favor of changes, while the uh, political result was continuation, uh, except for uh, a short period in the first half of 1992. Uh, so what was the result, the political result? Uh, first, Poland started the changes. So from the Polish point of view, when you talk about the fall of the Boring Wall, it's uh, a, a tricky question because uh, it uh, didn't start it in Berlin. Yeah? It started in Poland, then Hungary and Czechoslovakia, and it was, which is a shame for Poland, it was a Hungarian decision. Uh, I mean, Hungarians were the first, and we should be the first. Yeah? But the Hungarians were the first that decided to open the border. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Poland, Polish government at that time was rather shy, that semi-democratic, semi-communist government. The level of ambition was uh, Finlandization, if you understand what I mean. 
I mean, to uh, achieve the status of Finland of the Cold War years, uh, to respect geopolitical Soviet interests, but to have market economy and internal democracy in the country. That was still uh, the end of 1989, and Poland that started the changes was the last country that had um, free uh, parliamentary elections. It was in 1991. Now, we were the last country that asked the Soviets to leave our territory. It was September 1990, while Hungarians and uh, Czech and Slovaks did it at the end of 1989 and completed the process by June 1990. Uh, we did it after Lithuania, that formally, of course, from the Moscow point of view, not from the Vilnius point of view, was a part of the uh, Soviet empire. Uh, so uh, that uh, changes in Poland uh, started, but were rather slow. That was, and still is, the problem of communist heritage, because what I have said, Poland was very anti-communistic uh, nation. Uh, and please remember that we rebelled against communism uh, ignoring the after-war guerrilla uh, in uh, 56, in uh, 68, in 70, 76, 80, 81, and 88, 89, uh, while the others usually once. Yeah? So this is something that mm, built up Polish pride about that. But on the other hand, nothing is simple. We were the only country where not Soviet military direct interference uh, took place, but the internal uh, communist forces uh, used for the first time in Polish history, Polish army against Polish nation. That was a great moral break in all Polish tradition. Please remember that during 123 years of non-existing, non-existence of Poland as a result of partitions at the of, uh, end of the 18th century, it was military camp where Poland existed. Yeah? A piece of free Poland was where Polish army was in exile or in the country. And this uh, strong patriotic tradition of Polish army as the symbol of the independent of, independence of Poland was broken as a result of the martial law. It was completely against entire tradition. Uh, so uh, this was the moral result or moral situation in which we went out uh, from the communism. Uh, and uh, something that was rational in the spring 1989, that means a kind of compromise with uh, still strong or pretending to be strong communists. Uh, then, uh, when Poland was alone yeah, in the spring, then uh, when all the others in the region rebelled, uh, to keep the agreement after Romanian revolution was completely senseless. You know, we uh, need acceleration of the changes, we need uh, the completion of revolution. And the last remark, about uh, the specific situation of Poland. Please remember that the first Congress of Solidarity in 1981 uh, issued a famous um, appeal to the peoples of Central Europe, uh, including uh, peoples that belong to Russian Empire. Um, I was involved in the, as a young man in the distribution of underground press, and I remember books or leaflets or uh, newspapers about Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic states, um, uh, about uh, Czechoslovak Spring, about Hungarians, and so on. What does it mean? That means that, I guess, uh, uh, I dare to say that Poland was the only country that had the ambition to have an impact on Soviet internal empire. Our political goal, and not the goal of the government, but the public mood was that it is the beginning the goal will be achieved when the Soviet Empire collapsed. That means we need the independence of Ukraine, Belarus, and Baltic states in order to destroy the Russian Empire, whatever is the color of the empire. Whether it's white or red or yellow or green, it's not important. Yeah? We will be safe and free when the empire collapsed. So uh, when we gain our independence, that will be a na natural continuation to uh, try to uh, influence uh, our uh, eastern neighbors that share a common statehood with Poland during many ages uh, in history. Uh, so uh, Poland uh, developed uh, since the first half of 1990 uh, as the only country in the world uh, the deliberate uh, foreign policy aiming at the destruction of Soviet empire. 
Of course, we are aware of the fact that we have no potential to do it alone. Yeah, but um, we, uh, if it is a game, we said we have different scenarios and we will play to realize this one scenario. Unlikely, the West, do you remember the so-called chicken speech of Bush uh, senior in Kiev, who appealed to Ukrainians to vote uh, in favor of the Soviet Union? Yeah. So um, that was the time when Poland started uh, to create the diplomatic uh, relations with uh, Soviet republics uh, after they had declared uh, the so-called suzerainty, which in that particular historical moment meant that their republican law is uh, uh, declared to be superior uh, to the uh, Soviet Union law. Yeah. So we started to uh, establish diplomatic relations with Ukraine, with Baltic states. In Belarus, it was much more complicated. Uh, so um, unlikely the others, uh, we were the first. We were extremely slow with our revolution and shy till 1991 uh, and 93, and it's still uh, the problem till today about the purification of the state structures with the. Today, maybe not the former communists, however, some of them are still active. But first of all, uh, we have a, a kind of dynasties here yeah, in the politics and as well in economy. Please remember that the directors of banks or the factories of the, the communist state then became the uh, capitalists, yeah, the, the, the more convicted uh, liberals and so on. Uh, and we had that uh, scale of ambition to have an influence or on uh, our direct Eastern neighbors, uh, and it is still a core of Polish Eastern policy. I mean, the uh, perception of the decisive role of the decisions that are taken in Kyiv and decides about whether we will deal with Russian Empire or just Russia. And so this is uh, the difference of our perspective. Uh, and the last sentence, please remember that in a Polish case, uh, the communist system was from the very beginning perceived as an artificial, foreign, however, of course, as a result of the decimation of Polish elites during the Second World War, there were a lot of people who were promoted by the new system and thus uh, supported it. But it, uh, it was never enough uh, of them in Poland to maintain the system without Soviet uh, power when the Soviets were not able to interfere anymore, the system collapsed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prime um, That was wonderful to be reminded not only of the great power of the Polish imagination. Um, the ideas were always much more um, without limits in Poland than when you spoke to intellectuals in other parts of the Eastern Bloc. Um, and also, of course, to remind us why from Moscow's point of view, Poland was always such a major challenge, and for Stalin, it was so important to keep the saddle, the Soviet saddle on the Polish horse, as he said. Um, so, Mary, um, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll try and keep it fairly brief, because I'm sure everyone's wanting their coffee. Um, it's been three, 30 years now, so one generation since 1989, and of course this was initially treated in the West as the end of communism, the end of the Cold War, in effect the victory of so-called Western European values. Um, and since 1989 there's been, maybe under the surface, something of a culture war, it seems to me, between liberal and conservative values. Uh, in the West, both felt that they had won the war, won the Cold War, that they were responsible for the fall of communism in Central and Eastern Europe. And really this was the submission of the USSR and the victory, supposedly, of Western values. Um, one side suggested that the Soviet so-called empire had imploded because it was economically flawed above all. The people wanted material goods, needed the free market, capitalism, a Western economic model to be a consumer-oriented society that was able to deliver better than, uh, than the, the other system, so the West German model as opposed to the East German model. And the second line of interpretation, or one of the ones that was heard a lot, was the somehow spiritual superiority of the Western system and of the Catholic Church of so-called spiritual values, um, humanistic values, 
which were supposed to trump empty Marxist-Leninist materialism and um, the, the superiority of freedom over, over um, command economies and um, the imprisonment somehow of the state. So there was a, a great sense of superiority on the Western side which was to some extent measured, uh, matched by a sense of inferiority on the Eastern side. And this was very much associated uh, with the wanting to join the clubs, the EU, the NATO, and the need to switch sides and to be perceived to switch sides, to realign with the West, and then of course to retell post-war history in a new way in which this was the natural conclusion of that history. And we can see this shift, I think, most clearly in stages. So stage one, if you like, was the removal of communists, of communist symbols, of uh, communist rules, the legacy, as far as possible, drawing a clear, clear blue water between us and them. And stage two, if you like, was the creation of official memory, new memory, uh, and this is where we see the official narratives, the memorials, museums, and so on. And now I think we're still in a, a third stage, which is a stage of, if you like, uh, if I can paraphrase, paraphrase Kundera, memory and forgetting. And this is a particularly interesting place that we're in because we might say we're at a crossroads in how the European past is being reimagined and re-presented because we are ourselves now suddenly, rather unexpectedly, undergoing some kind of sea change, the end of which we don't know. So just as the new official histories are being passed on to the next generations in textbooks, in galleries, in museums, in exhibitions all over the former Eastern Bloc, this is at the same time that we're also hearing on our news every day about this new populism, this new ge geopolitical shift away from Europe um, towards Asia, the stresses within both NATO and the EU, and uh, so we're living in, as it were, dangerous times ourselves again. The, the happy ending to the fairy tale turns out not to have been the end of the story. And we're, we're I think, all aware of the shifting sands, the populism, the isolationism, the ultranationalism, and we can see the ugly side of this, the scapegoating of refugees, of minorities, the people who are least able to defend themselves. We're also seeing how the media has changed the story, changed the picture, is undermining traditional ways of doing politics, of the traditional, is allowing celebrities to become politicians rather than uh, trained people in the political arts. And the traditional aims to, to have the moral high ground seem to have slipped, to my mind, um, perhaps irredeemably after Trump and after so many populist leaders in power. Um, so I want to hold out one as it were, I'd sort of like to say two things to the former Eastern Bloc countries, the so-called second world, none of these phrases are very useful. Um, one is sort of a message of hope uh, that you might help us, and another is a warning that uh, there's maybe some examples that I hope we won't follow. And the first is this sense I have that maybe Central Europe will save Western Europe. Um, Westerners, it seems to me, we've become rather lazy Politically, we got complacent. We assumed that our system would last forever, that it was somehow didn't require any maintenance, any care to be taken. Um, we were unable, perhaps temperamentally, unable to imagine change. We became unable to imagine change. Whereas those in the East knew perfectly well, as you were saying, change is possible. You know that in your, in your skins because you've lived it and seen it. In the West, too many people felt, well, this clearly was the right system, it will go on forever, this is, this is the recipe for success for all eternity. So people in the East have had to think harder about many things that in the West we stopped thinking about, perhaps. Thinking about what democracy actually means, um, what does it mean, how might it be, how, might, how is the people defined, how is the nation defined, um, what are the possibilities of different kinds of governments, what is freedom? What could it be? So in a word, all of these thoughts, all of these more abstract concepts have had to be reclaimed, rethought, reconsidered by the East in a way that for a long time they haven't really been thought about too much in the West. Um, 
also, I think, things to do with modernity and bureaucracy, which are creeping everywhere, which are choking all our public, um, the, the public sector in particular. We see this in the NHS, in the BBC, at the universities here in Britain. So things like how subtle a thing censorship can be. This is something the East can teach us. How to maintain some kind of integrity um, when there is a, a, an emphasis on conformity. How to read through jargon and the, the dangers, the ways in which jargon can be used to oppress people in more subtle ways than, than with threats of prison and so on. So in all these ways, I think the East has an enormous amount to teach us and um, I sort of feel in a, in a slightly ironic way with the university sectors at the moment, we're all told that our work should have impact and should be, you know, uh, we should have transferable skills and I think, hmm, if you study Eastern Europe, you're gonna be learning some transferable skills, possibly not the ones that were intended by uh, the governors. So that's the part that gives me hope, that makes me think that's great that we are one unified Europe, that there is the EU, that we can be exchanging and helping one another to try and get through what looks like it's going to be a very difficult period. But now also I'd like to come to the dangers, the worries I have. And of course, in some ways, the worst of the 20th century happened in Central Europe, a lot of the worst of it. And it seems to me that one of the dangers to emerge from that is a form of nationalism which um, one sees not just in Europe, of course, and not just in Central Europe, but a, to my mind, a dangerous way of defining the nation in terms of suffering and martyrdom. Um, each nation in Central Europe, I'm not the first to say this, you know, has a story about its unique suffering, its unique martyrdom. Of course, that's all perfectly true. Uh, that there was terrible suffering. But when this becomes tied to the nation, to the notion of who we are as a people, and when it gets tied with some sort of notion of linguistic homogeneity or ethnic homogeneity, and starts to become equated with moral strength or purity or superiority, it becomes dangerous. And here I think history can help, and this is where I think that the well-intentioned idea of transforming, of ridding or purifying oneself of the communist legacy by having official histories which remove it as a sort of, as, as my colleague was saying, you know, as a foreign imposition, a, a thing that doesn't belong to us that we can't own, I think there are dangers there. And the dangers are partly that when each nation focuses only on the suffering that was done to it, the, the suffering that it had to endure, it forgets the suffering that it also has inflicted on other, on other groups. And this is, a, as it were, a common human problem. We remember the, the bad done to us, we don't remember the bad we've done to others. Um, so I think of, you know, Harabel, for example, talking uh, so wonderfully in the, about the Sudetenland, this, this sense of ghosts that one has all through Central Europe of the peoples who were displaced, the peoples who were murdered, the peoples who are not here. Um, there's again, apparently a Greenlandic proverb uh, that if you deny the existence of a ghost, you only make it bigger. So I think it's important to confront this past. It's better to admit the things that don't reflect well on one's own nation, to look them in the face. And as time gets tough, it's particularly important to protect and to take as part of one's mission and duty to protect the vulnerable. So if we can be specific for a moment, I'm frightened for the Roma, I'm frightened for, I fear for Jews, I fear for Muslims, I fear for refugees, I fear for a lot of groups at the moment. And I think the only way that we can really pay attention to the vulnerability and to our duty to protect is to, at least in some respects, be prepared to uh, undermine this notion of the nation and to look at people as individuals, not to think constantly in collectives, in generalizations about the nation, the people. Um, and so I suppose, I think if the East can teach the West a lot about how to cope in the modern world, how to um, avoid being subjected or, or intimidated or censored, I think the West can still teach the East something about how to protect the vulnerable and to value the voices of liberalism, integration, multiculturalism, multinationalism, not to consider these to be weaknesses or bad words or 
um, empty slogans from, a, from the left wing, but actually something that can make our lives more pleasant, more interesting, uh, safer, and ultimately, I think, uh, more peaceful. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, it's always good to be reminded that uh, one of the reasons why perhaps the West won the Cold War was because of its uh, moral superiority, um, which was certainly um, more than just a, a propagandist slogan. Um, and um, there was an element of moral superiority, um, largely because the West had to demonstrate to the world that it did have a better way of organizing people's lives in the East. Um, before I hand over to you, we've got about 45 minutes, um, just two observations really. Um, Barbara reminded us that capitalism is not the natural order of things. Um, well, of course, one's always reminded, particularly here within a stone's throw of the old British Library, where um, Mr. Marx was writing his ideas, um, that, of course, Marx realized that capitalism always contained the seeds of its own destruction. And therefore, if turbo capitalism continues to develop in an unbridled way, then if Marx is right, uh, we will see that it is doomed. Um, and then on the Polish transition, um, I think from Moscow's point of view, it was always clear that the, despite the difficult history of Moscow-Polish relations following the Second World War and indeed before and during the Second World War, the Polish transition would be easier to manage than the transition in the countries where there were hard line unreconstructed hardline governments such as Romania, such as Czechoslovakia, um, and of course East Germany. And, and from, a, from the point of view of statecraft, if you like, of, of how to strategically choreograph the Soviet withdrawal from its defensive glacis in Central and Eastern Europe, um, to a certain extent the, the, the challenges were going to be those hardline regimes rather than Poland, where an extraordinary uh, kind of, I think uh, Adam Zamoyski called his great book on Poland, The Polish Way, an extraordinary sort of compromise had, had, had begun to, to take over in many of the negotiations by the spring of 1989, not least the famous Okungi Stul, the, the round table talk. So, um, so it's fascinating that Poland, so for so many years, such a thorn in the side of the Soviet Union, um, actually demonstrated through a combination of, of intellectual and historical circumstances how it could actually um, create the conditions for a peaceful transition, which certainly a few years earlier would have been thought to be very difficult, if not impossible. So I'm very happy now to open it to the floor. So any questions, please? Yes, gentleman on the right. Yes. See me. Uh, a good, uh, good morning or good day to all of you, and thank you for uh, inviting us to be here. As a former student at UCL, I feel at home, but. Uh, even it's been uh, quite quite some time ago. Uh, my name is Imer Berish, I am from uh, Kosovo, and uh, in here I uh, want to, uh, I would like, I see the venue appropriate to bring something of a uh, viewpoint of the uh, Kosovo Albanians that lived in this, well, shall we say now, uh, probably in between two blocks, because of the position of Yugoslavia at the time and everything, all the rest. But uh, we also had Kosovo Spring, which was in March 1981. And at that time, unfortunately, information was not delivered, disseminated, as you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, dear professor, uh, as today. So we felt then that even the estimates were that 4, 480,000, basically one third of the population took on the streets in March 
1989 uh, demonstrating against the abolition of Kosovo's autonomy. And uh, uh, actually in 1981 uh, uh, against the position of Kosovo within Yugoslavia. But we felt that nobody heard us. I was one of the participants and actually 90% of my family were there not uh, talking to each other, just on their own initiative. So we felt that nobody outside knows about it. And then we have, we sometimes feel that the, the breakup of communism, if you like, and the first traces started there in 1981. Because, of course, in, uh, it was in, for Kosovo, it was two levels, if you say, two, two layers of it. One against uh, Serbia's rule, and the other one was general, that is appropriate to say here, against communism. Because we never wanted to, be, to do anything with communism. We were made part of it, wanted it or not. A decision that Kosovo would decide free in 1943, made by Yugoslav communists, which way it would go, it, what, it was not honored. In 45 and the rest, uh, we know the history, but going back to 81, from 1981, then we had repression of people who demonstrated about 4,000 people were sentenced until 89. From 81 to 89. In 89, we have abolition. Let me know the 90s, 91, 3, 4, 5, until 98, the, the uh, atrocities started, then the reaction from the population and the rest. So I want to, uh, uh, your professor, if you, to any one of you, uh, how does this correlate the, the events in, in Kosovo at the time and the events in general in the communist region? And is there any connection of how, do you have anything? What would you say, uh, having in mind the, the uh, 1981 Lech Walesa Polish movement and the rest? And of course, other springs in which we very much uh, uh, know that played and, and influenced the, the whole region but coupled with events in, in Kosovo and generally in Yugoslavia. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> well, I have to disappoint you, but in, in 1981, uh, you are right, nobody uh, heard about the developments in Kosovo, so there was no impact uh, of them on Polish uh, image of the situation at all. Please remember that there was still hard communism and the distribution of information uh, was only at the beginning to be, uh, the communist monopoly was only at the beginning to be broken. Yeah? And the first, the, the most important information uh, were information about Poland and the neighbors, and Kosovo was a little bit remote and out of the bloc. Yeah? Yugoslavia was not a part of the Soviet bloc. While it was quite important uh, 10 years later, I mean, uh, all the uh, sequence of the uh, Yugoslavian and post-Yugoslavian wars had a great impact on the uh, image of the situation uh, in Central Europe in uh, the Western eyes. I will tell you an anecdote that uh, I witnessed, I was a part of it, uh, in mid-90s in Luxembourg there was a conference and uh, of course at that time everybody, maybe, well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people in the West were afraid of the nationalistic possible clashes in Central post-communist Europe uh, the pattern was Yugoslavia. And one French uh, man stood up at the conference and said, well, uh, this post-communist Europe uh, is uh, all vulnerable for this kind of scenarios. So I stood up and protested and said, well, don't mix uh, Yugoslavian problems with Central European. There is no potential for that. Uh, sorry, I said, don't mix Balkan problems. Yeah. So the Bulgarian guy stood up and said, don't mix um, the entire uh, Balkans with Yugoslavian problems. So the Slovenian guy stood up and said, don't mix the Croatian-Serbian quarrel with Slovenia that took part only 10 days in it and has nothing in common since many years. Yeah, so uh, the closer you were to the spot, uh, the narrower was the perspective of the threat. Yeah? Um, from the French perspective, it was the entire post-communist Europe. From Polish perspective, the Balkans. Uh, from the Bulgarian perspective, Yugoslavia. And from Slovenian, only Croatian-Serbian problem. But uh, what you have said about uh, Kosovo and general, uh, I will exploit that topic because it's very important. I mean, uh, from the, uh, or in Serb uh, um, uh, historical memory, it's a very important area. Yeah? So uh, 
to translate in, into contemporary Polish um, resources or political assets. Please remem remember that Poland can understand all the parties to the quarrel because we were in the position of everybody. We were not existing. We lost uh, extremely important territories from the traditional and moral point of view for Polish history. And we get, uh, survived. Yeah, we uh, were able to uh, deal with that uh, for the sake of future, for the sake of cooperation with our uh, neighbors. Uh, there is uh, no at all, not at all, any uh, political force in Poland that is talking about territorial revisionism. Yeah? So uh, this is completely a historical issue today. Uh, and I think that is a kind of optimism. We were both. I mean, we were uh, dominating Serbs and we were uh, uh, dominated Kosovars. It depends to whom uh, and when. Yeah? So this Polish experience, as well about uh, the creation of the Union, we share that experience with Czechs and with Hungarians. Please remember that we had our own unions, yeah? whether it was Polish-Lithuanian Union or Austro-Hungarian Union or Czechoslovak Union, there were unions, and we know how the unions die and why. Yeah? What are the scene? The scene is all the time the same, namely the, the, the pride and the, the, the lack of respect to the minor partners. That's the main disease that causes the, the arrogant uh, position of the dominating powers. And uh, I think this lesson is uh, a universal one, and we have something to say to our Western partners uh, basing on our own scenes, yeah? well, because we were dominant, Czech dominant uh, in Czechoslovakia, Poland in Polish-Lithuanian Union, and uh, and uh, Hungarians, which was much more complicated. Yeah? Nevertheless, that was the uh, the experience that is still important, both that uh, experience of losing territories and accept the fact for the sake of the future, uh, and uh, the way in which you can destroy or you can save the union. You have to respect uh, minor partners. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wonder if that could include some lessons, perhaps, for the United Kingdom in the present crisis. Um, the gentleman uh, there wanted to ask a question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Jiří Přibáně and I'm representing the Welsh section at this conference, and, uh, or Czech Welsh section. And uh, uh, this was fascinating to listen to these three presentations, very original presentations, very different presentations. And uh, it was almost like uh, after Barbos' uh, presentation, I felt that Mary's response was, wake up. St yeah, uh, don't sleep anymore, wake up, look around, and you'll see a very different shape of Europe today that we live in today. We stopped looking for the, co uh, for the utopia because utopia by definition is a place that doesn't exist. Utopia is only a point of reference to criticize the current politics as Thomas More te uh, could teach us. And um, I wonder if uh, there is a in Barbell's uh, presentation, we, we saw what was important, uh, that uh, there is not just one nostalgia. There's many different forms of nostalgia. And I wonder whether this is a problem of Central Europe, that Central Europe in the West, in the East, divided uh, Germany and still believes that Kulturmensch is Übermensch, that culture is superior to dirty politics. And whether what we can learn from the West is that politics actually is not a dirty business, is a necessary job. And um, that we should engage in its follies with Erasmus uh, uh, rather than seek utopia. So I was wondering, Barbel, whether you would be ready to stage the coast of utopia by Tom Stoppard. Um, Mary, um, uh, I think you're absolutely right that um, what East can teach West is exactly the power of normalization. How much you can normalize and how far you can push with normalization. And uh, 
uh, completely agree with this uh, dark legacies uh, which go into uh, cultural pre-political definition of popular will. Which brings me to Professor Zhuravsky's um, uh, uh, um, uh, presentation and my question would be, are we really at the moment seeing uh, the struggle, the conflict of po between political elites in Poland, or are we seeing something which is much more sinister, which is a regress in constitutional democracy as an alternative to totalitarian or authoritarian communist regimes? And in this respect, is Europe, this is for all three panelists, is Europe somehow responsible to stop individual countries from backsliding from democracy, rights, rights of minorities, and uh, constitutional rules. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so perhaps we could start with Barbara. Um, Vielfalt of utopias, and uh, do you feel we ought to wake up and uh, perhaps embrace normalization rather than anything radical as perfection? Um, have you any thoughts on that? We're having a sort of uh, discussion here on the, uh, <laughs> on the profound philosophical hinterland of your questions. But, well. uh, sorry, my, my English is not so good. Uh, what I understand, um, my question of utopia is, uh, I, I think utopia is more a dream, yes? Or, wie sagt man, ein Möglichkeitsraum? Possibility, yeah, possibility to thinking uh, out of the system, out of the order, what we are, uh, was wir sind. Um, ich sag's mal kurz auf Deutsch, dann kann er es übersetzen, was ich, um, ein Gedanke, die Utopie denken ist nicht sich irgendwas Neues ausdenken, sondern um, das, was nicht in Ordnung ist, uh, anders zu machen. So utopia doesn't have to necessarily mean thinking something new, but something, um, jetzt habe ich vergessen, das something stuff. Das, was eben daran zu denken, was nicht in Ordnung ist. Yes, also, to think about ist, something which is not. Was nicht, was nicht, was falsch läuft in der Gesellschaft. Ah, which isn't right, which isn't yeah. working properly in Wir the society. Haben, genau. Um, um, to, to 99. I think um, we was in this, uh, I, I felt this, uh, uh, we want a new community, not capitalism, not social, socialism, not communism. Um, we want the new uh, created, a new, um, wie sagt man, um, Gesellschaft, um, Wirtschaft, also, we have think uh, about the social um, market wirtschaft. The social market. Um, social market, market yes. Right. Social uh, contract. What we need this, um, when I think about uh, climate change uh, now, um, yeah, that is, uh, that, that's important, we have to, we müssen umdenken und aus dem System herausdenken, das denke ich, ist die Aufgabe. Und wir waren 89 ein bisschen für eine kurze Zeit genau an diesem Punkt, dass äh, eine Veränderung möglich gewesen wäre. Ähm, deshalb ist man spricht jetzt immer nur von okay, das war weg und es blieb nur das, was eh da war. Und das war nicht irgendwie yeah, that was the tragedy. So 1989 provided a rare moment when suddenly one could think outside the box and perhaps yeah. 
imagined that the world did not necessarily have to go down either of the two competitive routes that would sort of the, the underpinning of the Cold War. Um, and it was tragic that that opportunity was lost. Yeah. And uh, what I mean with uh, Thomas More, <laughs> my friend Thomas More, um, he is uh, uh, from, from my piece uh, part two from uh, Goodbye Europe. Uh, he was an actor, <laughs> a part of him. Um, what I think from Thomas Morris, uh, that he damals in der Lage war, also im 16. Jahrhundert, aus seiner Zeit herauszudenken und er hat diese, diese utopische Insel kreiert. Für mich ist das nicht das, das, die, die, die kreiert, das kreiert, Kreieren des Kommunismus, sondern äh, eine Kreation von einer Möglichkeit, wie man solidarisch äh, gemeinschaftlich zusammenleben kann, ohne dass sich Einzelne bereichern können, ganz einfach, also wo das eine Verteilung hat. That, uh one could create a society where there was solidarity and uh, not necessarily rampant individual sort of enrichment. So thank you. Um, and Professor, uh, on the Polish. <coughs> well, I'm afraid we need a separate conference to explain the situation in Poland. But uh, shortly speaking, first general remarks. Please remember that uh, Poles are reluctant to any ideology. I mean, we say it in Polish that we don't want any ism, whether it's conservatism or liberalism or socialism or any other ism. Yeah, common sense is highly appreciated. Uh, so uh, these ideological clashes is not something that uh, are really deep in Polish culture and especially after tragic 20th century when we experienced two foreign totalitarian systems, communism and Nazism, we think that over -ideology, ideologization of the thinking about politics is a mortal threat for people. Uh, then, um, please remember that we are, uh, by our experience with communism, protected to the large extent, of course it's different in different generations, yeah? uh, but protected uh, from uh, political correctness speech, like new speech in Orwell. Yeah? Uh, I myself remember, when I was a pupil at school, I was taught that it was Tsarist army that smashed Polish uprising, but Russian army that liberated Bulgaria from Turks. It was the same army. Yeah? So we, we can detect uh, the uh, deep meaning of the words that are used to describe reality in an uh, ideological way. Yeah? About the present situation in Poland, uh, well, again, uh, last general uh, remark, we do believe, like the British did at the beginning of the 20th century, that is the quotation from the British debate about uh, the creation of dominions in empire, imperial times, that nobody is perfect enough to rule the others without their consent. And that is the answer to the question whether the European Union should interfere in national states' politics. No, because there is no democratic mandate that was granted by uh, the citizens to the bureaucrats in Brussels to do that. I mean, uh, there is the principle of, mm, it's Article 5, I guess, the Treaty of the European Union, that the Union is competent only in those areas that were granted to it by the treaties. This was not granted as a competence of the Union uh, to the uh, unelected people in Brussels to tell to the uh, democratic governments in the member states what to do. And it's one of the problem of the Union, I mean, the uh, deficit of democracy. This is rather the, this kind of challenge than the other one. As far as the situation in Poland is concerned, I would put it like that, that the uh, lack of knowledge about facts uh, lead to uh, misunderstandings about reality. So, uh, some facts. Uh, the uh, political clash that started between the presidential elections in Poland in 2015 and the parliamentary elections in Poland in 2015. The presidential elections were, law, were won by a law and justice candidate and the then ruling uh, parliamentary majority of uh, civic platform uh, being afraid of losing the parliamentary elections uh, 
illegally against the Constitution elected additional judges to the Constitutional Tribunal, and this uh, was done in order to create a kind of the third chamber of the Parliament with veto power to the new expected majority uh, in the Parliament in order to paralyze the reforms. And that uh, attempt against democracy was effectively uh, stopped by the new uh, majority after the elections. And please remember that in Polish constitutional system, constitutional tribunal is a tribunal of law. That means it is competent to judge whether this or that parliamentary act is in accordance with constitution or not. And it is not a tribunal of facts. That means it is not competent to judge whether this or that official was nominated or elected uh, to this or that uh, position uh, in a proper way or not. That means that the mistakes of the parliament are to be uh, corrected by the parliament uh, as far as the uh, personal decisions are concerned. And this is the case of the uh, judges in the tribunal. It's not a law, yeah? it's an act of nomination or rather election. So uh, this is how it started. Uh, and uh, I would like to stress it very much that in my opinion, um, there is no threat for democracy in Poland, just the opposite, it's flourishing. When we take into consideration the uh, access of the public opinion to the information, it's dramatically better than uh, before 2015, when you have all the mainstream TV uh, saying the same. Now you have very different opinions and you can switch the channel and choose whatever you want, and you will have extreme difference uh, commentaries and information in one channel and in another one. So this diversity is uh, much, much deeper than it used to be, and I think that the free distribution of information and comments is uh, the basic uh, condition for uh, good democracy. Uh, and uh, the problem is, of course, that uh, we had that uh, heritage I have described at the beginning. I mean, the uh, state structure that, uh, except for biological reasons, was not purified uh, from the former communists. Uh, and even today, when you take into consideration the uh, division in Polish political scene, you have uh, all the old communists uh, on the oppositional side that are fighting against all those changes that are uh, under the way in, in Poland. Uh, and uh, this is one of, of the side of the reality. Another one, I think, is um, the fact that um, we do believe that being an opposition to something, and we are in opposition to the mainstream of the European Union, is not like in a Russian system to be the enemy of the system. Yeah? I mean, uh, you are the opposition to the government, but you are not the enemy of the state. Yeah? Uh, so in that sense, uh, the present government in Poland has another idea about the desirable future of European integration, but that doesn't mean that it is against European integration. Yeah? So uh, in that sense, mm, I would rather uh, say, and this is as well the, the remark to your presentation, I think it's much more instructive to describe the present situation in Europe not by using words uh, populism and, uh, how to say the others, yeah, the, the, the normal people, yeah, uh, but rather the camp of continuation and the camp of changes. And the camp of continuation is much more homogenic, uh, while the camp of changes is very uh, heterogenic. I mean, there is no one vision of what is desirable in the future of the European Union. There is different Polish vision, Italian, uh, or, or French and so on, there is not such a homogenic uh, camp. On the other hand, we have populists in the mainstream. From our point of view, Macron saying about European army that will defend us against the United States, and uh, the one who is promoting uh, the uh, directive about uh, posted uh, workers in order to defend French jobs uh, against Polish, com Polish competition is a pure populism. Yeah? Mm -hmm. When you want to have European army without spending 2% GDP on uh, defense, it's a populism, and so on. Yeah, so uh, that uh, division is much more complicated. Thank you. Um, I think if we wanted to go down the EU route, we need another conference, I think. <coughs> um, Mary, did you want to Just add something? To yes. respond to Yuji, though, um, I, I, I suppose um, I can imagine an EU which I wouldn't welcome interfering, but at the moment I feel of, that it's a, that 
as it were, we need checks and balances, and we need some defender of, of um, supranational uh, interests, actually. And, and uh, I agree with you, democracy and liberalism both, I think, do need some protection at the moment. So. Thank you. Um, question from the lady in the front row. Thank you. My name is Regina Jenkins, and actually, for the record, I'm Ukrainian, so I pretty much know the Eastern Bloc. Um, I very much agree with uh, Professor Heyman, what she says about, um, in such a turbulent world, um, protection of minorities like Romas, maybe Balkans, smaller population, Muslims, okay, so it's really paramount priority. And um, actually, in recent couple of years of turbulence of uh, Syrian crisis, mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Zorowski, what is your opinion on Poland attitude of actually not taking any refugees, okay, yeah? And not, uh, and precisely because they're Muslims, okay, yeah? Um, and let's just be honest, because Syria is actually a very liberal Muslim country, as we know. Um, there is um, majority education, women educated, it's schooling, so we're not talking, um, well, other uh, groups which would be completely different and not be able to integrate it in European uh, things, but background, okay, yeah. And I was really quite surprised about Hungarian and Polish attitude, okay, no. And actually being Eastern European, I have to be honest, um, 25 years here and 26 years over there, I will say the Eastern European bloc significantly more, actually, uh, well, the racist world become seriously um, uh, over, um, overused, okay, you know. So there is a certain element of supremacy to, say, other nations and Eastern Europeans. I'm sorry, this is not really good things to say, but it is truth, yeah. So, and I'm pretty positive that half an audience here probably would be agree with me, okay, yeah. Especially perhaps in my population, which was born um, before the long time, well, about the same age probably, you know, so <laughs> I know what you're talking about, okay. Um, so Western world is actually much more tolerant, okay, because for 25 years here, I, I made my life here, I've never been treated differently, and I'm very much grateful to this country to give me an opportunity, because if I went in competition for jobs and positions, things like that, with the born and bred people here, and if I was better, I would be giving a fair game, okay, yeah? And to be honest with you, I would be questioning if it would happen in Ukraine or maybe even Poland as well. And the Germany as well. I have a friend who lives in Germany now. And uh, what used to be the GDR um, universities, they become actually now Western, populated by Western professors and by Western academia. And um, so Eastern European academia was, well, moved out, okay, you know, so. Look, this is the truth, okay, and uh, there's no point to stick your head in and say, well, it doesn't happen, okay, no. So, what's your opinion about Thank Polish? you, thank you. Um, that, I think the kern of that question, or certainly one of the most interesting parts of that question, was um, why Poland is not accepting any Syrian refugees. Um, and, uh, of course, when you said the Poles don't like isms, um, not that I think this is connected at all. Um, the one ism that we always identify as the foundation of Poland's identity is, of course, Catholicism. And so, um, not that I, as I repeat, I don't think that is why the Polish government is reluctant to accept refugees. Quite the opposite, I would have thought. But um, if you could explain, perhaps, the policy here, that would be very interesting. Well, another conference is necessary. So, uh, first about uh, Catholicism as a part of Polish identity. identity. Yes, of course. But please remember that uh, our Prime Minister, uh, Jerzy Buzek, uh, was a Protestant, and uh, nobody cared about that. Yeah? While uh, Tony Blair, in order to turn into Catholicism, uh, first he waited till he ceased to be a Prime Minister in Britain. So it's a different meaning in uh, internal politics. But the main question is about uh, immigrants and refugees. Well, uh, it's a long story. First, please remember that uh, it started for Poland in 1997. Uh, 
uh, when we were accepted as a candidate country to the European Union and of course to the Schengen zone and um, were asked or rather forced by the European Union, that was the Swedish Commission year uh, that for the first time uh, launched the action in 1997, to close the borders with our eastern neighbors. I mean, we had visa-free regime, and that was a great achievement after uh, the collapse of the Soviet system, that for the first time after half of the century, uh, the artificial border that divided our peoples for the first time in the history uh, was made penetrable for both sides. And for the sake of saving Europe from illegal emigrants, against uh, the will of our citizens, against our strategic uh, interest that was to open the borders for the experience of Ukrainians and Belarusians of a piece of the West in order to provoke their mental changes, we were forced to introduce first uh, uh, special fees, then visas, we introduced them in 2004 free of charge, uh, unlike the European Union that uh, collect money from poor Ukrainians. Uh, and then since 2007, full Schengen system with hard border. Since uh, 2001, Polish troops were sent first to Afghanistan and since 2003 to uh, uh, Iraq. Mm, uh, under the uh, or slogan or, or the, the uh, thesis, that there is a real threat of uh, Muslim fundamentalists uh, and we have to fight it far away from our borders. Those troops were sent with uh, a mandate to participate in uh, high intensity combat. Uh, and uh, for a thousand of years, this explanation was presented to Polish public opinion. Yeah, the threat is real, we have to fight it and we have to pay the uh, price of blood of our sol soldiers in order to keep the threat far away from Poland. Uh, so those two facts, yeah, the Poland as the borderland country of Schengen zone that is responsible for, for protection of eastern external border of the European Union from illegal immigration from the area between the Book River and Pacific Ocean, yeah, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Thailand and so on. Uh, and the other factor, Polish soldiers abroad sent for high combat intensity operations side by in for the sake to fight uh, Muslim uh, fundamentalists. Uh, and then, overnight, by the decision of German Chancellor, against the European law, the borders were opened and we were said, keep the border closed for Ukrainians we at that time negotiated the um, uh, widening of the uh, small border uh, traffic uh, in order to include Lviv to this uh, zone, which is one million agglomeration. And we were said, no, one million of Ukrainians, it's too much that it's a threat of illegal immigration. But please open your borders for Syrians, for Somalis, and so on. We are democracy. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, you cannot overnight say, okay, the old sacrifices, and we lost a lot of jobs by uh, closing borders with Ukraine and uh, Belarus, especially in the late 90s, when there was still great unemployment as a result of the collapse of the uh, communist-style uh, economy. Another issue is that what was the reality? There is not a humanitarian challenge, because we were not asked to take the people from the poor boats on the Mediterranean when they are still threatened, when the, their life is at risk. The reality is that we were asked to take the people from the refugee camps, the people that have been already saved, and to share the financial border uh, of maintenance of those people, and then we were asked to accept the people on our territory against their will. Please remember that there is no refugees, neither immigrants that are storming Polish borders, but they are or, or who are landing at Polish coasts, uh, and, or who are uh, walking across Polish territory. Physically, they are not in Poland, not in the Polish neighborhood. We are out of the main transit routes of those uh, uh, immigrants or refugees. 
so in fact we are asked to serve, sorry for the expression, as a kind of Siberia. That means the place where people are deported against their will. Now, somebody in Brussels will take a decision to deport this or that part of uh, immigrants and refugees to Poland. However, the majority of them, for obvious reasons, wanted to go to Germany, to Austria, to Sweden, and to Britain, not to Poland. Whoever wants to go to Poland can apply to Polish authorities, undergo the proper juridical procedure, and if uh, the, all the, uh, the papers are correct, he will be accepted. Yeah? But we cannot agree to the situation in which somebody is sent against his will to Poland, and uh, according to the decisions that are taken uh, by uh, other centers than Polish uh, government, after a dozen of years of the training of our public opinion that this is a real threat, I mean Muslims, and we have to fight them in military way, far away, uh, in a situation that, uh, let's be serious, nobody is able to check who is going in. Now, how you can uh, check the uh, people uh, from the regions that are the war zones in the Middle East? Uh, you, you cannot cooperate with the state apparatus of Syria or Iraq because in this uh, sense, effectively, it, it doesn't exist. Yeah? Um, so, uh, for the sake of uh, security of the country, uh, for the sake of uh, the uh, moral principles that nobody can be forced to live in Poland, uh, and uh, for the common sense, as I have already said, uh, it was impossible to accept that. I mean, that was the, the, another factor. Yeah, we were said you will pay. You will be paid 7,000 euros uh, per capita if you accept uh, 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 an immigrant, but if you refuse, you will pay 250,000. So which amount of money is a proper calculation of the cost of the maintenance of uh, a refugee or immigrant? 7,000 or 250,000? Uh, 250, and then uh, come in front of your electorate and explain it yeah, and win the election. Uh, so this explains a lot about the developments in Poland in 2015. I mean, this story since 1997, and Poland as a, a main protector against illegal immigration uh, from the east. Please remember that Finland has the only uh, comparable long border with the east, but it's Arctic area. Uh, very few people try to cross uh, green border in Finland. Majority cross green border in Poland. Slovakian and Hungarian borders are small. Uh, Thank you. That was the, the main uh, situation. Thank you. Um, the gentleman, yes. Yes. Are you calling me a gentleman? <laughs> <laughs> Unless you feel it's insulting. Thanks very much. Do I need to shout? Do I need to... Yes, yes, I probably do. Uh, if you hold the microphone close okay, to your lips. Thank you very much. Okay. I think, Barbell, I hope I will not mispronounce anyone's name. Barbell, I think I, I think I noticed three strands in what you said. Another interesting. One was a protest against the reunification. You said actually, I think you said that the GDR disappeared. So I detect a certain nostalgia for the GDR, which is rather surprising, but I'd like you to comment on that. And secondly, I noticed that you mentioned the need for a more humane world. And I wonder if perhaps um, that's not impossible given the fact that, as someone pointed out, politicians are education's mistakes. Or put differently, I'm harking back to Plato's suggestion that until politicians become more philosophically sophisticated, there'd be no peace for the human race. That's almost a quote in the letter to Glaucon. And I want to agree with that. Politicians have not moved away from an ancient tradition of defining themselves and the people they govern with reference to where they were born and they never mention that all of us were born on Earth, and that we're basically Earthlings. And so I think that the solution to the problems we face as individuals and as a species lie in education. Uh, to quickly add, I, I don't think that we are British and French and Germans and Poles and so on. We're human. Human is the identity. The rest, the others are identifications and they're fluid, convenient, and optional. You can't say you're not a human being. 
I'll move on. I'm not going to mention Mary's contributions at all because I agree with everything she said. Just kidding. But more importantly, <laughs> Professor Zarevsky, I have quite a few comments I'd like to make about your presentation. Uh, I noticed that you began, it, it's, it was historical. You didn't begin with 1989. You went back at least to 1945 when, of course, Poland became, after which Poland became a part of the Soviet Empire. And I wonder very quickly uh, why you would explicitly disagree with that and agree with Polish troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. After all, it is clear that the Soviets, Stalin and the rest, were seeking to create buffer zones to protect themselves from any, from any future incursions from the West. And I would like to point out that the decision to make Eastern Europe or countries in Eastern Europe part of the Soviet Empire was not unilateral, it was trilateral. The West, Western leaders, Churchill and Truman, agreed to give the Soviets a sphere of influence. The condition was the Soviets would keep out of the West sphere of influence, that is, keep out of Western empires. The Soviets broke the rule, most significantly in Cuba, that almost led to World War III. And I think you should mention this. And if you're going to say, and I hope you don't, that um, the, the, the Soviets, the, the opposition to the Soviet empire is palpably necessary by virtue of the fact that the, 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 the Ribbentrop um, Molotov Pact, then we should recall that in 1934, uh, I think it was the Pilsudski government, did sign a non-aggression pact with the Nazis in 1934. I, I, I'm almost sure I'm right about that. So I, I want to say that we should not continue portray, portray Poland as a victim of its neighbors and as a victim of its tragic geographic location. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that's uh, a very um, pleasantly and uh, refreshingly explosive contribution. Um, I'm always reminded on these occasions that when the British ambassador to Berlin in 1939, the Archer Pisa, Neville Henderson, uh, went to try and persuade, I think it was Beck, uh, that he should, um, uh, who was visiting Berlin, should um, fall in with German demands. Um, I think Beck famously said, uh, listen, if it comes to war, I'm not particularly worried because I'm a Pole, I know how to die for my country. So um, uh, what do you say, Professor, to this idea that um, <coughs> Poland is not a victim of geographical and historical circumstances? Well, I, I should repeat what I have said, <coughs> that we need another conference. Yeah. But uh, first, yes, we are not a victim. We are a victorious nation. Uh, at the beginning of the previous center, uh, all the odds shows that we will share the fate of Russians. Fortunately, we don't. Uh, I am born in the former Russian part of Poland. I am not threatened anymore to serve in Vladivostok and fight Japanese in Russian imperial wars. My children, when they are sent to school, will be instructed in Polish and will be not whipped for speaking in their mother tongue as it used to be before 1914. And it is a tremendous success. And as far as uh, those facts that you have mentioned, uh, we need another conference. But please remember that uh, Poland regained independence in 1918 due to the fact that German uh, Kaiser Reich and Russian Empire and Austro-Hungary collapsed. Austro-Hungary finally, while German and Russian state temporary. And they cooperated uh, unofficially since 1917 when German intelligence sent Lenin to Sweden and then to Petersburg, starting Bolshevik Revolution. And officially, uh, or semi-officially since uh, November 1918, when Oberost signed the agreement with uh, Bolsheviks to give the lands to the Bolsheviks, not to the Poles. And since 1922, officially as a um, result of a Rapallo agreement. And this German-Soviet cooperation lasted till 1933, when it was broken by Hitler. And Polish political obvious goal and interest was 
to make the gap wider, the gap between Berlin and Moscow. So Poland signed the non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union in 1932 and <coughs> again in 1935, uh, which moved Moscow uh, far away from Berlin and signed another pact with Berlin in 1934 in that moved Berlin far away from Moscow before signing the pact with Hitler about non-aggression, non not about the partition of another country as ribbentrop Mortov pact. <clears throat> uh, Poland uh, tested the French readiness to start the preventive war against Germany. The French refused and Polish potential was not large enough to, large, to launch the operation alone. So uh, we need to buy time to uh, make that gap between Nazi Germany and uh, Soviet Russia, Soviet Union, that was started only a year, uh, had been started only a year earlier by Hitler, not by Russians, uh, to make it uh, long lasting and uh, wider. And that was the, the only um, uh, goal. And we uh, have a document of that year, the special um, assembly of the main uh, councillors of Piłsudski. One of them, Kazimierz Świtalski, uh, wrote in his memories that in 1934, uh, Piłsudski said that now we are sitting on two uh, chairs. Uh, it's not a long-lasting perspective. Uh, he can uh, guarantee four years. Then uh, the situation will be changed. 34 plus four is 38. 39 was not covered with that guarantee. So there was uh, a very clear uh, image of reality and it was correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we've just got a couple of minutes, so I would just ask perhaps Mary and uh, Babel to say perhaps some closing remarks. Mary, would you like to start? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm prepared for closing remarks. Um, I suppose um, I would just maybe urge us to think a little bit about how these stories are constructed and um, the very notion of a spring, a thaw, and so on, I have slight problems with. So I think just as the way, just in the same way that we all uh, distort our own memories of ourselves, present ourselves in different ways at different stages of our life, I don't think any of us wants to remember who we were at 14, you know, what we <laughs> wrote in our journals, how we thought, how we saw the world. Um, so with nations, they're constantly rewriting, the, you know, the winners write history, and whatever group is dominant at a certain time, is perpetually recasting, reformulating, representing itself, um, and I think it's 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 easy for us to lose our sense of individual responsibility if we allow ourselves to believe that we belong to a worthy, virtuous collective, um, which you know either through suffering or through um, heroism or through tenacity is somehow better than other great collectives. So I think I would really really just responding actually to what the questioner was saying, I, you know, I, I agree with you about we're human first and we're individuals first, I think. Um, we're individually responsible for our actions. So it's not, um, I don't, even a, a collective like communists I find really problematic as just a, a way of perceiving people. So. Thank you. Uh, um, Um, I think um, we need uh, uh, we have we have to to looking the different the different angles um, and I think yes we are human on the earth yes we need we need a parliament of the human we need a world parliament I think so that is uh, <laughs> my dream. But um, the question of nostalgia, mm, that I don't like that. Um, but uh, it's put on in the box, yes? It's, it's uh, put, put in the box of the nostalgia. Then uh, it's a question of uh, um, in individuality, mm -hmm. yeah, of identity. It's geht um uh, what, what I say from the GDR. Um, is lost uh, a little bit uh, their identity, yes? Um, and that's a question of the 
of the generation uh, for 30 years and it's geht weiter, yeah? that we have to, to discuss and uh, to open uh, the mind from the West uh, to look in the, in the East mind, yes? what, is, uh, what is the basic from, from to be a human in a social, yes, to live in a social with the other also, um, with other values. With other values, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is uh, very prägend. This is prägend for the same. Yeah, enriching, yes. So yeah. For many people, yes. And um, to uh, what I say to the passport from FRG, yeah? I, I didn't want one. Uh, what I want was a European passport. Mm. That is better. Yes, no, thank you. Um, well, I think we've had a tremendously um, stimulating and in in interesting panel to begin this symposium. Um, and I would just really say I didn't realize I would be sharing the panel with um, the late St. Thomas More. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, when Thomas More was executed along with Cardinal Fisher, um, the news really sent shockwaves through Europe. And Charles V uh, broke the news because the Habsburg Intelligence Service was very efficient to the British ambassador, Elliot, uh, and said, I'm very surprised. I would have given my richest kingdoms to have two men of such quality in my empire. And that, I feel, you know, the ghost of Thomas More is, is there, hovering over our disputations, really, even today, because they show, and perhaps the panel has helped to explain this this morning, that our views of events in Central and Eastern Europe are very much formed by the perspective we have grown up with in the countries we have grown up with, and that those perspectives are often very different and therefore trying to marry those perspectives to find a common humanity um, is perhaps the great challenge of the 21st century. But let us please um, show our appreciation of the panel in the traditional way. <laughs>